G'day guys and gal. Today we continue our groundbreaking series at attempting to fix the cluster bukkake that is the end times. We've already covered how the lizardmen and elven races should have had their end times corrected and so far you guys have loved it. Apparently I even made a bunch of you guys cry during my reforged Mazda Mundi death scene. So I'm excited to see what I can do with everyone's favorite midgets. I was going to throw the Chaos Dwarves in this video as well, but I've realized they have absolutely zero connection to the non-BDSM Dowie during the end times, so it'd be reasonably pointless. Don't worry, I'll cover them in the future. I know I said it for the Elves and the Lizardmen, but the Dwarves really got the shizen end of the stick when it came to the end times. Many of their lords and characters were killed quite unceremoniously and didn't even really contribute much to the survival of the world. We're going to change that. As a wise man once said, Midgets are people too. The same rules apply. Major plot points must not be changed. So if the main plot point requires a character to die, they must still die. However, we can change the details and justifications of their actions in order to make their deaths way more epic and acceptable. Fortunately, the Dawi don't get a moon dropped on their heads, so at least we don't have to try and work around that. Now, before I get started, I have one favor to ask. As many of you know, Major Kill's love life has struggled lately. The woman of my dream stringed me along for a month and dumped my ass. To get back on the horse, there is only one possible thing we should do. If you really support me, and I mean more than just Patreon or sending me nudes, then I need you guys to go to this girl's Instagram and DM her. Major Kill sends his love, and, and that's it. Nothing creepy or anything, just, just that message. There's no way to win a girl more than blowing up her DMs with thousands of the same message. It worked before, so let's do it again. Have you done it? Nice. Okay, let's get into it. Now as a bit of a prologue to the end times, Tyrion's secret daughter was the diplomat to the Dawei from the High Elves, and the Dawei loved her. However, she is kidnapped by the forces of the undead in order to be used in a ritual to bring back Nagash. This hurts the relations between the High Elves and the Dwarves, hence is why they don't interrupt much during the end times. The beginning of the end times for the Dawi started just like any day for them, having a big old tug and argument about whether or not they should just kill some greenskins, then seal themselves off from the rest of the world, or if they should go out and basically sacrifice themselves to aid the world. Thorgrim is keen to do his part because he's an absolute bro, but many of the other dwarven lords have led up their asses so they're not as eager. This debate doesn't last long however as actions are set into place that the dwarves cannot ignore. Firstly, the Greenskins and Skaven get extra frisky and start attempting to PENETRATE many of the Dwarven holds, whilst the Undead start reviving their god Nagash. Both of these events fall into the unideal shit going on category of the Book of Grudges and get things in motion. As a start to the Dwarven end times, this is fine, it's pretty standard stuff for the Dawe, and so far nothing too retarded has happened, so let's continue. It's important to note that King Belagar Ironhammer had already retaken Karak 8 pits by this point, which is a major plot point for the Dwarven End Times. A bit more on that later. Now, in canon, an alliance of men, elf, and dwarves attempt to reach Arkan and stop him from bringing the Gash back to life. However, due to crippling autism, only the High Elves actually make it in time. This is a bit of a cop out for our Dawi and actually a bit insulting for the vampire counts as it basically says their entire faction could barely hold off a detachment army of High Elves. So by making it that all the forces of order reach the ritual side of Nagash, then it makes for a way more epic battle and it also, you know, makes the vampire counts look less shit. For context, the elven forces led by Eletharion and Araloth and the Dawe forces led by Ungrim Ironfist. The humans are led by Hans Leotorf, which is lame, so we're swapping him for his way cooler brother, Marius. In my version, the armies collide, man, elf and dwarf ripping deep into the endless tide of zombies, desperate to reach Arkin before he can finish the ritual. A counter charge led by Wallach Harkin and his blood knights collide with Empire Knights and Silverhelms alike killing many of them. To make matters worse, Helmand Gorse leads a large regiment of Graveguard and hit the Dawei line and halt their advance. Manfred also joins in, leading an elite contingent of vampires, as well as various Vargeists and Vargulfs that crash into the disorganized lines of the Wood Elves. To reach their target, the forces of order had been virtually surrounded by the massive undead army. Soldiers would die but could not even fall to the ground due to how tightly packed everyone was. The ritual neared completion and it was a dire sight. 
until Ungrim motherfucking Iron Fist cleaves his ass in an arc, slicing a helmet open from balls to brain before shouting, I despise the unliving, or some generic downer quote that the dwarves always say. With their binding weakened and the dwarves' morale renewed, they easily smash past the grave guard on their lines and split into two forces. The slayers led by Ungram rush to the aid of the wood elves against Manfred and his beasts, whilst the rest push forward to relieve the pressure of the blood knights off the empire and high elves. Ungram leaps into battle, welcoming death but eluding it all the same, lopping the head off a nearby Valgul for the single shot as he slays tear apart the Vargeists. The gunfire and axes of the dwarves caught up with the blood knights, who could not endure the onslaught. Eleutharion, seeing his opening, called Stormwing to his side and flies towards Arkin, kicking Manfred's ass along the way. However, in an intense struggle against Arkin, which I detail in my Fixing the Elven End Times video, Eleutharion was killed and Nagash was reborn. With the resurrection of Nagash, Ungrim calls a retreat and he and his dwarves aid their allies in escaping. Exact same result as canon, however we get to see the dwarves in action and make the storyline a bit more epic than it would have been otherwise. Now the return of Nagash sucked mega balls for our Dawi, as now they had a new enemy on top of the already very problematic Ratmen and Greenie boys. The next major event for the dwarves was the invasion of one of their southern dwarven holds by the armies of Neferata, who wished to give the dwarven goddess Valaya to Nagash as a way of being like, welcome back my scary skeletal overlord, please don't rape me, rape the Dawi god instead. Neferata's massive army fought against the Dawi defenders, led by Thoric Ironbrown, King Kazador Dragonslayer, gaining the upper hand. In canon, Thoric is fatally wounded and overloads his Anvil of Doom which acts like a nuke, destroying most of Neferata's armies whilst King Kazador is killed by Krell. Nagash is then summoned by Neferata and he drains the layer of magic then fucks off. This kinda sucks. First cause two legendary dwarf characters get slaughtered without taking out any meaningful characters with them, and one of their main gods gets raped in her sleep. Very grim. The theme of the end times for the dwarves was avenging all their grudges, however Kazador's main grudge, aka saving his family and killing Gorfag Rotgard, was never even remotely avenged. Gorfag literally shaved Kazador's son and crucified him alive on Kazador's throne. Like bruh, that shit ain't gonna fly. On a side note, I wonder if this video got demonetized because the word Gorfag has fag in it. Mm, probably. Here's how we fix this. In my version, Neferata attacks the Dwarven Hold, and an intense battle ensures. Her numbers advantage means that despite the valiant defense of the Dwarves, she is slowly winning. Krell and Kazador engage in a duel, with Krell slowly gaining the upper hand. Suddenly, Thoric jumps in and slams his rune hammer against the Skeletal Warrior, cracking open his skull. Krell turns and slices his axe across Thoric, dealing a mortal blow. This allows Kazador to swing his axe and slice Krell in half, disabling him. Krell is a skeleton directly connected to Nagash. Nagash can just click his fingers and bring him back to life whenever he wants, so it doesn't really matter if he cops a few cool deaths here and there. Thoric tells Kazador to take his people out of here and survive to fight another day. Kazador, seeing the situation as hopeless, agrees and falls back, leaving Thoric and a small force to cover their retreat. Thoric limps to his Anvil of Doom and strikes it as hard as he can, again and again and again, cracking it more and more with each blow. By the time Neferata realizes what is he is doing, it's too late. She quickly runs in terror as Thoric strikes his hammer for the last time, blowing up the anvil and everything within a big radius turns to smithereens, ending the battle. Thoric's life and Neferata's army. The explosion breaks open Valaya's gate and the goddess walks out, her very presence causing pain to Neferata and her remaining undead. She summons Nagash and the two gods face off, however Nagash is too powerful for her. He drains her of her power but leaves her alive, seeing no purpose of killing her. Also, Valaya is the Dawi goddess of love and home and shit, so perhaps Nagash, you know, eating her magic softened him up a little bit. Who knows? In this version, we get to see Kazador survive, whilst Valaya doesn't get wrecked while sleeping. Thorek still gets to do his epic Alawakbar, and the main plotline remains unaffected. Some of you guys have been giving feedback saying I am going too soft and not grim dark enough in my versions, so try this for size. 
Khazador begins leading his remaining warriors and people across the mountains to try and link up with Thorgrim and the main Dwarven army. However, he is blockaded by none other than Gorfag and a large Greenskin force, way too large for his exhausted warriors to defeat. Gorfag mocks Khazador, saying he's long since slain his imprisoned kinsmen and feasted upon their flesh. Khazador drives into a cold rage. He orders his men to form up with the intention of holding the Greenskins long enough for his people to escape through a nearby underway. He charges straight towards Gorfag and the two armies collide, whilst the women and young make a run for it. Khazador yells in anger as he tears Gorfag's bodyguard to shreds, desperate to get to the Orc Warlord. The two meet in combat as Khazador's warriors are massacred around him. They strike at each other, neither caring much for defense and just trying to tear each other apart. After moments of intense fighting, both warriors are bleeding from a dozen wounds, however Gorfag is able to push harder than Khazador can. Gorfag monologues for a bit, taunting Khazador about his nieces and kinsmen screamed as he peeled off their flesh before he strikes. Khazador moves and allows the blade to embed deep into his abdomen. He then grabs the blade with one hand, locking it in place, using his own torn armor and bones to help lock it. Whilst the other hand, he swings his mighty axe and embeds it into Gorfag's skull, shattering it and launching his brain matter across the battlefield. The king smiles for the first time in years as he sees his final grudge avenged before he too passes. The Greenskins finish off the Dawi army and begin chasing the fleeing dwarves, however they find their path blocked at a chokehold by none other than Grombrindle, the White Dwarf. The Greenskins laugh and charge forward, seeing only one old dwarf to try stop them. That day the Greenskins laughter turned to screams as hundreds died to Grombrindle's rune axe. The survivors eventually reach the safety of Karak as Karak. That was a new original story that I put together in my own version to pay homage to our Dawi and to give Kazador a proper send off while also giving an end to a popular green skin character. The next old plot point is the massive three way battle for Karak Eight Peaks with Belagar in command of the city whilst the Skaven and Greenskins simultaneously siege it. At the start of the battle, the Skaven, led by Queek Headtaker and Skarsnik, team up whilst Belagar hires mercenary ogres to help him defend his city. Part of the way through the battle, the ogres turn on the dwarves, Queek kills Belagar, the Skaven turn on Skarsnik, then Thorgrim arrives as the Incarnate of Metal, the Incarnate's been basically a massive buff for certain characters due to Teclas collapsing the Vortex, and kills Queek before he gets killed by Deathmaster Snix. Then the whole hold explodes and everyone dies. Such a mess. Let's fix it up a bit. In my version, Skarsnik is way too cunning to accept a proper deal with Skaven. He is the chosen of Mork after all, however he accepts a pretend alliance. They siege Karak Eight Peaks together, however he turns on the Skaven before they turn on him. Makes much more sense that he's literally the chosen god of Mork, the god of or god of cunning, whilst Queek is just a fierce leader of Clan Moors, and Queek's like 7 years old. Not a strategic genius by any means. Belagar and his warriors hold the line, refusing to retreat out of pure stubbornness despite the overwhelming odds. He begins evacuating his people whilst his last lines continue to beat back the meat grinder of goblins and rats. In canon, he stays at Karak Eight Peaks because he's a stubborn asshole, not because it serves to protect his people. Hence, in my version, he holds the line in order to buy time for them. He also knows Thorgrim is on his way. Eventually, Queek and Belagar meet in combat, but only after Queek has allowed a number of his elite warriors to fight Belagar, wearing him down and wounding him. Queek is a skaven after all. The two legendary lords fight, with Belagar using every ounce of his strength. However, between the occasional storm vermin striking at a mid jewel, combined with Queek being fresh and boosted by foul magics, Belagar eventually falls and has his head taken. Just like Cannon, but at least he didn't die in vain. Thorgrim arrives, still as the Incarnate of Metal, and his Dawei begin counter-attacking Quick's forces. Thorgrim rips through the Vermintide, using the Axe of Grimnir as well as his powers as the Incarnate of Metal to cleave a path to Quick. Quick, being a cocky bitch, throws Belagar's severed head towards Thorgrim and issues a challenge. Quick lunges at Thorgrim and is caught mid-air before Thorgrim snaps his neck. This is what happens in canon and I actually like it, so not really changing this part too much. I am however changing this next part, which is just so stupid. Basically, for some unclear reason, the Winds of Metal abandoned Thorgrim, leaving him vulnerable. 
Apparently, Thorgrim also has dementia as he accidentally left a secret door open, which allows Deathmaster Schnitch to sneak in and assassinate him very unceremoniously. In my version, as we discussed in Fixing the Lizardmen End Times, Deathmaster Schnick is in fact in Lustria, and Thorgrim isn't a dumbass who leaves doors open. The Winds of Metal also don't abandon Thorgrim. So after dealing with Queek, Thorgrim looks around and sees that Skarsnick has retreated already after being unable to beat the Skaven and that the entirety of Clan Moors is in Karak Eight Peaks. Even with his axe and metal, there is no way to win this battle for the Dawi and the Skaven were already pushing his forces back with their endless tides and improved magic. Thorgrim knows that a retreat is useless as his forces will get changed down and massacred by the faster Skaven army, so he does the only thing he can do. He dips his very will and soul into the winds of metal, lifting up all the thousands of weapons and armor around him and casting it at the Vermintide. This holds him back for a time and Thorgrim issues a retreat. As a Dawi, he is not used to magic, however, and the effort begins to break him apart. As his forces leave the Apex, Thorgrim draws the very oars of metal within the mountain to him, creating an earthquake and breaking the foundations of the ancient hold. The entirety of Karak Eight Peaks cracks and shakes as Thorgrim's body is torn to shreds and the winds of metal leave its dead host to find another one worthy of its power. The mountain collapses and buries the countless millions of Skaven under it, wiping out Clan Moors. Same result as canon but way more climactic and actually feels like a worthy sacrifice, i.e. Thorgrim dies but takes out a major Skaven clan. If you have noticed yet, most of my adjustments I make serve to make the plot more epic and last standy, which is because this is Warhammer Fantasy's last hurrah, and marks the last moments of many of our beloved characters, so why not give them a send off that only Michael Bay could hope to match? The survivors of Karak Eight Peaks link up with Ungram Iron Fist, the last remaining Dwarven King after the deaths of Kazador, Belagar, and Thorgrim. This sucks for Ungram as he really just wants to fucking die, but now he's the king of the entire dwarven race. Bugger. Luckily enough, the winds of fire see Ungram as a good host, hence he became the incarnate of fire, which is, you know, a bit naughty if you ask me. Ungram honors Thorgrim's legacy by leaving the holds behind and combining his forces with the empire. He does this in canon, but it's like, not because he's being honorable, it's because, you know, the mountains get gas attacked. But yeah, in my version, we'll make it about honor. The forces of dwarves and men prepare to have a hectic battle at the Siege of Averheim. Now between Karl Franz, the Incarnate of Heavens, and Ungrim Ironfist, the Incarnate of Fire, so much ass is kicked that Chaos's plants of world domination grind to a halt. To me, this is fine for canon, I think it makes sense and allows the dwarves to finally meet up with the other factions and not just get stuck down fighting Skaven and Greenskins, like they have been for the last million years. Eventually, Averheim is evacuated as Chaos begins to slowly overrun it. Ungrim and his slayers remain behind to cover the escape of Karl and the other dwarves. This is fine, however in canon it doesn't really show how Ungrim died. Just like he just gave in to the rage of fire and then something happened and he was no longer alive. And then the fire left him and found a new host. So let's give him like an actual ending, not just some eluded bullshit. Let's give him a real ending. I was tossing up between making him nuke himself with his fire powers, however that's a bit overdone at this point, so instead in my version it goes out like this. As Chaos prepares for its final push to take the city, something unexpected happens. The walls of Averheim blow outwards in a wall of fame, the rocks and debris crushing and killing thousands of chaotic beings. Ungrim and his slayers sally forth, every one of them glowing hot with fire in their eyes. They smash into the walls of Chaos Warriors and Demons, tearing deeply into their lines and massacring them, each slayer taking out four or five heretics before fulfilling their oaths. Ungrim himself tears through bloodthirsters like butter, exalted champions become his cum dumpster until he finds himself facing against Archaon himself. The two warriors duel, hacking and slashing at each other as Ungrim continues to heat up and the fire around him grows brighter and hotter. Only Archaon's chaotic enchantments and his armor of the Everchosen keep him from incineration. Eventually Archaon impales the Slayer King, causing Ungrim to smile and say, my oath is now fulfilled, before erupting into an explosion of fire, knocking Archaon on his ass and burning the shit out of him. This also helps explain why Archaon wasn't present at every battle. The fires wounded him and he needed time to heal. It also gives Ungrim the finish he deserved. 
With all their kings dead and having no incarnates left, the Dawei take a back seat for a while, retreating with the other forces of order to Athel Lorren. The only three remaining dwarves worth giving a shit about are Gotrick, Grombrindel, and Joseph Bugman. I honestly wouldn't change Gotrick's end times. He finally meets Grimnir and gets killed and revived by him before receiving the second axe of Grimnir, because, you know, Thorgrim doesn't really need it anymore. Armed with both axes, Gotrick and Felix go into the realms of chaos to try to stop Belakor from becoming a god, and they succeed with Gotrick slicing off the Dark Master's arm. He is then given the ultimate Slayer reward, an eternity in the realms of chaos standing in front of a gateway that leads into the fantasy world, killing anything that tries to cross into it. Badass. He also makes an appearance during the final battle of Mindheim, however we will cover that later as I don't want to spoil my own personal version of the Warhammer fantasy ending. In canon, Grombrindel steps up as the new leader of the Dawi, but doesn't really get involved in the politics of what's going on and just patiently waits for the final battle to occur. In my version, that is okay, but he should definitely be more vocal and act as a voice for the Dawi. He used to be their high king after all. Just to show that our Axie boys haven't been forgotten and they're still as important if not more so than some of the other races. Finally, there is a scene where Grumbrindle saves Malekith's life in canon and basically says, I forgive you for causing the deaths of millions of Dawi and, and forever ruining the relationship between elf and dwarf, which is horse shit. Yeah, yeah, good, there should be forgiveness seen from the white dwarf and Malekith, especially due to my version of the elven end times, but Malekith should earn it. A good way to do this would be for one of the Dawi holds nearby to Athel Lauren gets attacked by Skaven and Malekith musters up a force to save it. When questioned why he would risk elven lives to save the dwarves, he would reply, because we keep our oaths. During the battle, Malekith would get ambushed by a vermin lord and only just saved by Grombrindle. This would give the white dwarf a good reason to forgive Malekith and would continue to enrich Malekith's redemption arc. And that does us for today, guys. Hopefully I've kept this series at a high standard and it's really nice to see that there is a solid audience for it. I've been taking feedback from you guys over the last two episodes and I've been incorporating it into my final narrative video, which will be the end times, but actually good. Pure lore and no analyzing, if that makes sense. But yeah, keep that feedback coming. If you want to support the channel further, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 a month gives you access to everything, including a shitload of custom Warhammer hentai. Join the Discord for more memes and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.